Is there any evidence in the solar system we can use to test the universal constant theory of gravity? When looking to test gravity in the solar system, one set of objects stand out. Comets. Also, the recent history of comet study is interesting and worth reviewing. Today, conventional theory asserts comets are ice balls. This theory has been around for a long time. It was invoked to explain the light from comets, asserting it was ice reflecting sunlight. But it wasn't until 1949 when Fred Whipple published a physical model based on the theory that the dirty snowball theory of comets became mainstream. For the next 35 years, conventional comet modelers gathered every reason they could to support the dirty snowball theory. By 1986, the call to validate the dirty snowball theory had rallied a huge amount of support in the space science community. 1986 was the year Halley's Comet was due to fly into the inner solar system. There was enough interest that eight spacecraft were set to observe and measure it. The ESA satellite Giotto flew the closest to Halley at 596 kilometers and into the tail to collect data. Conventional theory said the comet tails were sublimating comet material. Giotto's water detectors found a lot of water in the comet coma. This was taken as good evidence in support of the ice ball comet theory. But not all measurements met predictions. One of the results that was unexpected was that the sublimation material seemed to emanate from the comet in discrete collimated filaments instead of the ubiquitous general spread expected if an icy surface was exposed to the sun. This was explained by saying that the sublimating ice was under the surface of the comet nucleus and as it sublimated it had to punch through a rocky surface to escape. Another unexpected result was the comet surface was as black as charcoal. Comet modelers at the time adjusted their models appropriately by now describing comets as icy dirt balls instead of dirty snowballs. Also, while the pictures of Halley were poor compared to more recent photos, they were detailed enough to show a rugged comet surface, with hills, mountains, ridges and at least one crater. This didn't fit the melted snowball model, but nevertheless the dirty snowball model was adjusted to fit the new data. Also, the water detected from Halley had a much higher deuterium percentage than that of Earth's surface water. This discredited the idea that the Earth's surface water came from comets. Despite this, the comet origin of Earth's water theory was still popular in the space community 25 years later. Also, the shape of Halley was odd for a dirty snowball. It was an unshelled peanut shape. Above all these measurements, there was one property of the comet in particular that, if measured, would be a strong test for the dirty snowball theory, that is, the comet density. Comets were thought to be loosely bound ice and dust, and this should have a density of around 0.6 grams per cubic centimetre. In theory, as the Giotto spacecraft flew past Halley, measurements could have been made of the spacecraft's Doppler shift and combined with the celestial orientation, the influence of Halley's gravity could have been inferred, and from that the strength of the gravity field, and from that the mass and density of Halley's comet could be found. But in 1986, Giotto flew past Halley too fast, at 68 kilometers per second, and at too great a distance, at 596 kilometers, for any such method to be used. On top of that, during Giotto's closest approach, it was knocked into a spin by a small fragment of rock, travelling at a relative speed ten times greater than a high-velocity bullet. It took 30 minutes to restore communication with Earth. Comet modellers had to guess the mass and density of Halley, based on virtually no evidence. Their guesses were in good agreement with their snowball models, but there didn't seem to be any revision in their density estimates of comets, in light of the new evidence that comets were icy dirt balls. Dirt is denser than ice, 
so comet density estimates should have gone up after the Halley encounter, but they didn't. How did comet modellers justify this? Perhaps they argued the surface of the comet had accreted dirt and rocks from many kilometres of melted dirty ice, similar to glaciers on Earth, which can have a rock layer on top but be icy underneath. That way the internal nucleus of comets could still be mostly ice, and so density estimates could remain unchanged. In summary, the Halley encounter in 1986 had not given a clear answer to the comet snowball question. For some people, the readings of water in their comet coma were strong evidence in support of the ice ball theory, while for others the dark featured surface, the collimated filamentary jets and the odd peanut shape of Halley had cast out on the snowball theory. The comet community would have to wait at least until the next decade for more answers. In 1993, the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was discovered orbiting Jupiter. It had already fragmented into smaller pieces. It was soon realised that Shoemaker-Levy 9 was on a collision course with Jupiter. The time of collision was anticipated to be summer of 1994. Many of the world's most powerful telescopes were redirected from their existing missions in order to watch the collision. The comet disintegration was expected to yield vast amounts of detectable water and ice, which would have been a dramatic confirmation of the ice ball theory of comets, and would have silenced any argument to the contrary. Based on their dirty snowball model, comet modellers estimated Shoemaker-Levy 9's density to be around 0.6 grams per cubic centimetre, and estimated it was loose porous ice and dust. The collision released much less water than hoped for by ice ball believers. They didn't really acknowledge that their ice ball theory had been dramatically discredited. Wiki tries to explain the lack of water by saying the comet didn't fall far enough into Jupiter to disturb water within Jupiter. This avoids the point entirely. The comet itself was supposed to be a source of water. Shoemaker-Levy 9 was a significant blow to the dirty snowball model. The event had been given international media limelight, and when no water resulted from the impact, it was seen by everyone. Perhaps if Shoemaker-Levy 9 had exploded in a cloud of water vapour, comet modellers would still be talking about it now, calling it a spectacular confirmation of the snowball comet theory. In the 2000s, high-risk photos of comets were obtained by spacecraft. Some comets looked like asteroids with characteristic highly cratered surfaces. How could this be the case if comets were snowballs? Snowballs would melt in the inner solar system, leaving a smooth melted surface. Other comets resembled Halley in what was becoming a characteristic of comets, having two nuclei connected by a neck how does this fit in with the snowball model, and why wasn't it predicted? It wasn't until 2014, when the Rosetta spacecraft flew into Comet 67P's gravity field and acquired an orbit around the comet, did science get its first decent gravity measurements of a comet. With gravity measurements, an estimate of the comet's density could be obtained using the old Newtonian gravity formula with big G as a gravitational coefficient. The density for 67p was deduced to be about 0.5 grams per cubic centimetre. This was in rough agreement with the dirty snowball theory. However, it was at odds with the previous notion that comets were more icy dirt balls than dirty snowballs. A dirt ball with 0.5 density would be greater than 70% empty space by volume. This requirement by conventional models that comets are mostly empty space is a striking part of their theory, but it is not given much significance as a strength or a weakness of the theory by modellers. However, it seems sensible there should be some limit to porosity. How porous can a comet get? 60% empty space? 
70%, 80. In the 2000s, Comet modelers had estimated that Comet Borelli 19P had a density of just 0.3, which led modelers to describe comets as fluff balls. In 2014, the Rosetta spacecraft and its Philae lander captured the best photographs yet of comets. To some people, these cometscapes look rocky. Other people insist that all the scenery is made of dirty ice. If these photos came from Earth, Mars or the Moon, then everyone would agree the features were made of rock. On a comic though, several obscuring factors make it difficult to interpret. 1. The belief that comets are dirty snowballs. 2. Unfamiliar light quality. A dark object can appear light if enough light is shone on it, and vice versa. 3. Comets have microgravity. Perhaps a fuffball in microgravity would be less prone to collapsing under its own weight than in planet gravity. Rather than just saying it looks rocky, can we qualify differences between rock from dirty snow? 1. There are dunes on the comet. This discredits conventional comet theory. Dunes require wind and small loose particles. There is not supposed to be any wind on the comet, and loose particles of ice would quickly sublimate in the inner solar system. The dunes are likely made of sand. 2. Craters. According to conventional theory, craters are due to high velocity collisions from external objects that vaporise on impact. These collisions should be very rare, occurring a few times over a million years. The melting of snowball comets should remove any such crater features. This goes for all rough features on a comet's surface, yet comet surfaces are rough. Conventional theory has difficulty explaining this. People who support the dirty snowball model will see the light patches and conclude they are ice. But why would sunlight select not to melt these patches while close by cavernous holes were melted? 3. Direct measurements of the crater albedo are not tricked by unfamiliar lighting like the human eyes. As with previous comet albedos, comet 67P is as black as coal. There are some parts that look distinctly like rock, and other parts that could be ice. Then there are large boulders of rock, and smaller ones, and smaller ones still. At some point it becomes difficult to distinguish these small rocks from the suspected ice. This blurring between the smallish particles and brightly lit small rocks should not happen if the albedos of rock and ice are different. And since the rock has been measured to have an albedo of coal, then we should have no difficulty distinguishing ice from rock on the comet's surface. Patches of light material look to have been sprinkled on top of dark bedrock. Scree slopes are often lighter than the surrounding rock. Many of the slopes on Comet 67P look like scree slopes. But the idea of surface ice on comets was discarded by most icefall comet modelers long ago. Over thousands of years of orbiting the inner solar system, all surface ice would have been melted. The ice exists only in the subterrane, they said. Again, it's plausible to argue the comet photos discredit this idea too. Comets are supposed to be loose fluff balls of dust and ice with an outer coating of accumulated rock and dust left over thousands of years of melting dirty ice. But comet surfaces are rocky, not dusty. There are large boulders on the comet surface. Are they ice boulders? How would an ice boulder with an albedo of charcoal 
manage not to melt after thousands of years in the inner solar system. We can be pretty sure that the boulders on the comet are rocks. Next is the topography of the comet. It is mountainous. These mountains are supposed to be the loose rock piles left over from thousands of years of dirty ice melt. They don't look like dust or rock piles. They look like solid rock. In February 2016, Nature published the most up-to-date analysis of Comet 67P based on Fred Whipple's 1950 snowball model and the best data from the Rosetta mission. Despite being designed to penetrate ice, the fully functional Rosetta radar failed to see into the deep interior of Comet 67P, so as usual Comet modelers had to make some sketchy guesses, but at least now they had gravity measurements to help. They estimated that the nucleus was, by volume, about 73% empty space, 18% dust and 9% ice. Also, the gravity measurements had suggested the nucleus was homogeneous in composition and distribution. 9% ice. This is hardly a victory for the dirty ice ball model. And 73% empty space. Somehow this doesn't seem right. And Comet 67P is an average density comet. By the same model, comets such as Borelli 19P are reckoned to be more than 80% empty space. Keep in mind some mainstream models based on the same Rosetta data have Comet 67P at even lower density. The ESA model has it at 0.47 grams per cubic centimetre. This would require the internal volume to be about 80% empty space. If Comet 67P is homogeneous in interior, why is the exterior so varied? The ice ball model suggests it's been melting slowly over thousands of years. This long gone bulk of the comet would be expected to have been homogeneous as well. Finally, consider the heavy theory work of comet modelers over the years. In 1949, long before the age of exploration of comets began, Fred Whipple first published his guess on comet theory. Since then, comet modelers have had over 50 years of exploring and refining this chosen comet model. In all those years, there was never one theorist who predicted charcoal albedo, boulders, and mountainous terrain on comets. No one predicted that the mountain on the comet would resemble solid rock mountains. None of them said that there would be dunes or craters, or there'd be no water when a dirty snowball crashed into a planet. None of them suggested comet interiors were 70% empty space. Yet they are now asking us to believe that, with hindsight, such features were expected from the dirty snowball model. In the news it's become so routine to hear that astronomers were baffled or surprised by some new observation, that no one sees anything wrong with it anymore. Here is an alternative model. Comets are solid rock. Comet features that look like sands, dunes, boulders, rock mountains, rock surfaces are in fact sand dunes, boulders, rock mountains and rock surfaces. Comets are asteroids but in highly elliptic orbits. What is the basis of this model? Comets look rocky. Rocky objects are the most common objects in the solar system. Based just on that we should assume that anything that looks rocky is rocky. How does this fit in with the gravity analysis, suggesting the comet density is so low it's 73% empty space? Simple. Gravity theory is wrong. Big G is not a universal constant. The only place Cavendish experiments have been performed is on Earth's surface. They have not been performed on the Moon or in low Earth orbit by any satellite. The assumption that the gravitational coefficient measured on Earth is also the same for every other world and throughout all space, is wide open to being wrong. If Big G is not a universal constant, then this cuts the link between gravity measurements and the current deduction of comet density by Newton's gravity formula. Comets no longer need to be three quarters empty space and can have a typical density of rock, about 2.5 grams per cubic centimetre.
This is even more crazy when we consider that we've sent up highly advanced satellites that have attempted to test the ultra-weak general relativistic effects of Earth's gravity. It's all an enormous waste of effort and resources until we first establish the coefficient of gravity beyond the tiny realm of Earth's surface. In summary, we have the model proposed long before any exploration of comets began. That started off as a dirty ice ball model, which, faced with evidence, became an icy dirt ball model, which is now a 73% empty space model that keeps throwing up erroneous predictions and keeps failing to predict major features, and which is based on an untested assumption that is wide open to being wrong. The three quarters empty space model of comets may be an artifact of conventional theory trying to preserve the universal constant assumption of gravity. Assuming Big G is a universal constant has led to the underestimate of density for both comets and Jupiter. And both times faced with these very low densities, theorists didn't question gravity theory, but tried to explain this away by proposing radical models. Comets were three quarters empty space and Jupiter was a gas giant. Debate amongst conventional theorists and comet modelers should no longer be about whether comets are made of rock or ice, but about whether comets are three quarters empty space or solid rock. In the next video, we'll continue to loosely explore the theory and speculation surrounding the Juno mission, and hopefully look at some of the latest results from Juno.